Hello, welcome to this video, and on this video I'm going to be asking the question how good really was Frank Zappa as a guitar player? Now we know Frank Zappa has recorded some of the most virtuoso music um, ever seen in the history of rock music. Um, the musicians in his band were amongst the best musicians ever to record in, in this style of music, absolute virtuosos, including guitar players like Steve Vai, Warren Cucurullo, uh, Mike Keneally, all virtuoso guitar players. Now, if we look at the uh, recent list that Rolling Stone put out of the greatest guitarists of all time, Frank Zappa made the list, so you might be asking, why is Andy asking this question? You know, surely, it, it, you know, he, he's, he's perceived as being a great guitar player. Well, I think his reputation as a guitarist is, he's undervalued, basically. That's what I believe. I think he should be mentioned in the same breath as a Jimi Hendrix or a Jimmy Page. And I think there's a number of reasons why he isn't, and I want to explore that on this video. Um, this complaint against Frank Zappa um, has come to me more from my associates, you know, musicians I've worked with. Um, it's very rare that guitarists will mention him as an influence, for example, and when I do discuss his guitar playing with other guitarists, they often will complain they find him messy, right? That, uh, that technically he is not on the same level as, uh, say, an Ingvi Malmsteen or a Frank Gambale or an Alan Holdsworth. Uh, and I think that sort of comparison is unfair. Now, if we go back and look at the sort of beginnings of Frank Zappa, Frank Zappa emerges in 1966 onto the scene with the album Freak Out. The album was recorded in 1965. Um, Freak Out was an absolutely groundbreaking album. And I think that's undervalued in terms of rock history um, of how important and influential that album was. On that album, he pioneered so much stuff, it's almost too numerous to mention, but you know, it's the first double album, it's the first album to really explore um, improvisation in a rock context, it's the first conceptual album, it's the first album to sort of bring classical influences in, um, it's the first album to, you know, push the studio, push, you know, push multi-tracking and overdubbing, uh, of, of creating strange sounds in the studio environment. It just goes on and on and on. Freak Out is an absolutely um, groundbreaking, innovative album. And Frank Zappa's guitaring is also uh, on that level. Frank Zappa emerged in 1966 playing guitar solos um, really before the likes of Jimi Hendrix or Jimmy Page or Jeff Beck have emerged. He's a pioneering guitar player. And it's his innovations, I think, with which we need to judge him, not so much judge him in a technical context. Now, if we look at rock guitar at that time, rock guitarists are really coming out of the blues tradition. Um, there's plenty of virtuoso jazz guitarists, but the, the, the rock guitarists that emerged in the 1960s and changed the face of guitar, people like Jimi Hendrix and Jeff Beck, um, they're really coming out of the blues. Now, um, Zappa also was drenched in the blues. And um, he takes the blues and he moves it to an area which very few blues guitarists have done. Um, his first innovation, I think, is the fact that he puts the guitar centre stage. You know, very early on, he is playing very long improvised guitar solos. Those guitar solos contain the blues, but they also contain another um, another uh, couple of innovations, I believe, which is uh, firstly his uh, um, commitment to improvisation and actually um, looking at areas of free improvisation, seeing the guitar as um, an instrument to create sounds. This is something that Hendrix did. Um, and Hendrix gets the credit for this. So there's a story that um, Hendrix um, popped over to see Frank Zappa and Frank Zappa showed him a wah-wah pedal. And uh, Hendrix took a shine to this and he took it off, you know, and he um, took it into the studio 
and he recorded perhaps the greatest use of the wah wah pedal, which was this. That melody um, comes out of the innovations and interest that Frank Zappa had in using the guitar to create new sounds. And not only did he use effects to do this, but Frank Zappa also used the studio. He would often speed up his guitars to create very ornate, um, intricate melodies. Um, as his guitar playing develops, we see him exploring sound um, even more deeply. And he starts to develop a very overdriven um, distorted sound which is very beautiful he is I think one of the great um, innovators of tone and um, often on a Zappa album when you hear someone like Steve Vai kick off on the guitar his guitar sounds nowhere near the sort of majestic um, vastness of Frank Zappa's guitar he really explored pickups he explored um, amp setups and this came from his great knowledge of the recording studio. Um, Zappa was in a unique position in the history of rock music because before he was signed, he owned a recording studio, Studio Z, which he took over in the early 60s. And he um, pioneered a very early five track recorder. So Zappa was experimenting with multi-tracking. Now I'm going to do a video about multi-tracking because when you look at the history of rock music, it seems aligned to the um, development of multi-track. So when we look at something like Sgt. Pepper in 1967, that album was recorded on four tracks and those, that four track studio was one of the few studios at Abbey Road, and I think they did some recording at Trident that had these sorts of machines. Um, the, I think Sgt. Pepper was actually recorded with two four tracks that were um, joined together. Um, a couple of years later, Frank Zappa's making uh, Hot Rats, and Hot Rats is recorded on a 16-track multi-track recorder, and this allows Frank to do so much more in the studio. Now, I mentioned Hot Rats because Hot Rats in 1970 is one of the first guitar-led albums. It's a guitar solo album. Um, if we look at, say, what Jimi Hendrix or Jeff Beck's doing at that time, the closest we get to that with Hendrix was probably the Band of Gypsies that was recorded the, the same year, pretty much, uh, recorded on New Year's Eve 1969. Uh, but with that album, it is still a collection of songs, although Machine Gun does have a very long extended guitar solo and he's, he's one of the most important guitar solos in the history of rock guitar. But Zappa was doing it that same year, and actually, if you go back to Uncle Meat, he's doing it before. So Frank Zappa is one of the first guitarists to create guitar-led compositions. And I'm not on about the shadows, I'm not about someone playing the melody, I'm on about an improvised centerpiece. Um, this is almost the beginnings of, you know, rock guitar playing. Now, as we can see, Zappa's an incredibly innovative guitarist. At a time where we're seeing that certain guitarists emerge, and technically, if we were to put him against, say, a Jimi Hendrix or a Jeff Beck or an Eric Clapton, his virtuosity level is, is on par with those guitarists, in some ways, and with certain guitarists, even more so. Um, Zappa's interest in modern classical music and his um, early role as a fun functional guitarist in his band meant that he was having to negotiate his own compositions, which at the time were the most complex compositions in rock music. So he must have had a level of virtuosity to get through those compositions. A lot of the time when you listen to Zappa albums, right up to the early 70s, um, he is playing the guitar in these incredibly complex um, compositions. Um, he was blazingly fast. Now, the speed aspect of guitar playing, when you look at rock guitar, the actual history of that, which I think is where people judge Frank Zappa unfairly, because I think what they do is they... They look at the likes of a John McLaughlin or an Aldi Miola or, or um, Alan Holdsworth and they compare him against that type of guitarist. Guitarists who are pioneering technique. Now, um, jazz guitarists, on the whole, were strict alternate picking guitarists. And um, when we listen to, you know, your Charlie Christians and your Barney Kessels and Joe Pass, they're alternate picking and they're virtuosos at that. 
Um, by the time you get to the 1960s, the session guitarists that were working at that time had that sort of technique. And as Frank Zappa famously said, if you really want to hear um, technique, you know, go and listen to Tommy Tedesco. Now, Tommy T Tedesco was a session guitarist uh, around in the 1960s, played on loads of pop tunes and could just absolutely play anything. And that was the sort of virtuosity that existed in the 1960s on guitar. The rock guitarists were not exploring that type of virtuosity. They were exploring something else. And Zappa's also exploring those things, which would be um, the... Um, use of blues improvisation, the use of distortion, feedback, you know, bending the notes, all these things uh, are, the, are, the, are where we start with the technical aspects of guitar playing. So someone like Eric Clapton is a virtuoso guitarist, but he's a virtuoso guitarist in his understanding and ability to perform in that sh Chicago blues style, which is a certain thing. Um, as guitar um, develops, People like John McLaughlin um, bring in a different approach to alternate picking. And then in the early 70s, we see all these very fast pickers. The legato approach of Alan Holdsworth doesn't really develop in guitar playing until perhaps the 1970s. Holdsworth being probably one of the main guys to really push legato playing. And then in the 1980s, Frank Gambale comes out, you know, with sweep technique. Now, Zappa is not of that period, so it's unfair to compare him with guitarists of that era. Um, Zappa needs to be compared with your Jimmy Pages and your Richie Blackmores and your Jeff Becks. And I believe he's on par with those guitarists. And in certain instances, the things he's doing, which are playing long-form guitar solos, he is beyond them. Now... This is the central part of this video for me. I think Zappa is a truly great guitarist in his ability to play long form guitar solos. He was fundamentally a composer and he saw improvisation as instant composition. So when he's doing a guitar solo, right, rather than trying to show off his chops, he is trying to create a, a coherent logical composition. And his ability to do that, the compositional chops he had, meant that he could play very interesting guitar solos that went on for a long time. Um, the, I think the reason for this is because he had a wider palette of stuff. Uh, so Zappa would do things like he would trill. This is early like tapping on the guitar. And this is something he doesn't get credit for. He would tap the plectrum at the top of the guitar you know, create like a, a high pedal tone and then move underneath, creating these incredible sort of fast harmonies. His, his picking was, was messy, but incredibly fast. And he would often pick in, in using like quintuplets or septuplets, he would pick um, uh, rhythms that were outside the normal compound or simple time. That's, a, that's an absolute um, innovation there. But also, as the 70s develop, he's responsible for bringing in all sorts of altered scales into rock guitar improvisation. Um, and this is something that Jimmy Page did to a certain extent, John McLaughlin was doing it to a certain extent, but Zappa really goes in there. His, his ability as a modal improviser, his ability to use sort of modal playing, to use sounds, noise, feedback. He had this incredibly wide palette that he would use in a compositional way to create in very interesting long form guitar solos. Um, towards the end of the 70s, he um, starts to pull together guitar solos from live recordings. Um, when Zappa went out, he took a multi-track recorder and by the end of the 70s, he was recording almost every single gig. And he innovates in this area as well. Because he, um, in doing this, he's able to capture these improvisations, which almost to him are like new compositions. And so we see um, later on, we see new tracks emerging that are actually created out of the guitar solos from say Inca Rhodes or Black Napkins. Uh, and he starts to pull these guitar solos together and he does two things in the late 70s which are absolutely incredible. Firstly, he st starts to organise these into uh, a guitar 
solo led triple album called Shut Up and Play Guitar. And I think this album for me needs to be um, seen in the same light that we would look at A Kind of Blue, for example, or A Love Supreme. It, this is a groundbreaking album in terms of improvisation and it has a huge influence not only on rock music but on jazz. But also what he did, he would start to peel off his guitar solos. So if he'd done a guitar solo live and he liked it, he would peel that off onto a single track. And then in the studio on albums like Shaky Booty and Joe's Garage, he would get the, the band to, to play and he would drop this guitar solo in. You know, this would be in the studio, the band would play and at that point he would just fire this recorded guitar solo in for the musicians to improvise. Now this is absolutely groundbreaking stuff, but of course, if we listen to most jazz fusion albums made now, that is precisely how they're made. Um, it's very rare that musicians now will go in the room and play together and improvise together. What they're doing is they're layering their solos. And that's a different type of improvisation. Frank Zappa is an absolute pioneer of this. Um, these two approaches for me are absolutely groundbreaking. So let's have a look at Shut Up and Play Your Guitar and just discuss the innovations on the album. So to start off, I don't think anybody in the history of music has ever released a triple album of guitar solos, which is what that album is. Um, and for me, when I discovered this album, it was just on continual rotation. Um, Zappa is doing all sorts of things with that album. And the most groundbreaking thing for me is the way his solo relates to the rhythm section. And by the time he got to Shut Up and Pay Guitar, he had hired one of the greatest drummers in the history of drumming, which was Vinnie Colliuta. Vinnie Colliuta, before he joined Zappa, had become very interested in polyrhythms and tuplets. So for those of you who don't know what a polyrhythm or tuplet is, I will now explain it and I will try and demonstrate it um, with my body and my voice. That's what I'm going to try and do now. So in music we have a pulse. These are called crotchets or quarter notes. Music is based down into a pulse like this. One. Now in normal music, we break this down into simple time, which would be one and two and three and four and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a. And that's how most people play. They break it down into eighth notes or sixteenth notes or maybe thirty second notes. But we can also break those down into threes. This is called compact pound time. So let's go back to that sort of daddy beat, the crotchet. Here we go. So we've got one, two, three, four. One triplet, two triplet, three triplet, four triplet, or sex tuplets. Badly diddly daddly diddly daddly diddly daddly diddly. But this time, we could also break if we wanted it into five, like this. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Right? Now if we do this, this starts to almost like break open the the, the rhythm in the same way that um alter scales and cadences open up the harmony. So when you're improvising, what is always happening in music, this is the fundamental aspect of music, is the way that um, you create consonance and dissonance. So usually when you're improvising, the consonance is by playing the notes that work over the chord or the mode, and the dissonance is moving away from that harmony and create notes that are really out of tune. Anyone who tries to improvise one of the big mistakes they do is they believe that they have to play in tune to improvise. You don't. You have to, to create the inter in, in interest, push the harmony away from the, the, the home, the root that, is, that, that the harmony is rooted in. And that makes you sort of go, whoa, and, it, and, it, and it, it creates a tension. Now, there aren't, there's no such things as out of tune notes and in tune notes. What we have is some notes are more in tune and some notes are less in tune and you can create more tension by moving away. Now, when you move away, this is time-based. And so the timing um, is so important, which we would call phrasing. The phrasing is so important for creating that tension. So there's certain points where you could play an out of tune note and it will not be perceived as out of tune and there's certain points where it will really be perceived out of tune. It's not down to the harmonic structure, it's down to the rhythmic structure, it's down to the time-based placement of that note. All right? 
Now, if you're playing in time, but but say you go but but now I just played a 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3. And that there, when you hear that, uh, 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 that also creates a rhythmical dissonance. And so if you're playing modally now, where, you're, where there is no actual movement, and, and, and modal playing was, was pioneered by... Um, Originally in jazz by George Russell and some of those theories, then Miles Davis brought into it into albums like Milestones and Kind of Blue. And then um, when we get to sort of the free jazz period of uh, the 1960s, people like John Coltrane are using modality. Now Coltrane would often use both of these techniques to create tension. He would play inside the mode, but he would stress it by playing notes that were outside the mode. And he would also stress it rhythmically. In terms of rhythmical phrasing, in improvisation, I believe up until Frank Zappa, what you had was time-based improvisation, which would be based upon, you know, eighth note, sixteenth note, simple time and compound time, or you would have rubato playing, which is you're just not playing, you're just floating over the top. Zappa's very mathematical in using these these different tuplets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that sound is very zapper. You know, that, that sort of sound is integral and it creates a sort of rhythmical tension. Um, Vinnie Colliuta, before he joins the Zappa band, is very interested in these tuplets. And once he joins the band, Zappa trains him, and he said, said so. He said this in interviews himself that Zappa trained him to um, improvise using tuplets. So he was he was looking at it in a sort of um, structural sense. You know that you've, you're, you're you're reading rhythms and you're playing a composition. And Zappa had already pioneered this this use, but with Vinnie, um, Vinnie starts to react polyrhythmically to what Zappa's doing. And so we start to see a new type of improvisation in terms of how the rhythm section is relating to the guitar player. And the way that we have this time ticking here, but over the top of this we have these, these different tuplets that are weaving their way around. And um, for me, this was absolutely groundbreaking uh, as a drummer. And also as a guitar player, I play guitar as well. And um, I think with Shut Up and Play Your Guitar, he opens up a new way of improvisation, which throughout the 80s, 90s, starts to become a new way of improvising. And now when you go on the internet and watch a lot of sort of virtuoso musicians soloing, you will hear that much more metronoric, metronomic approach. And so here we can see the zapper not only as a pioneering guitarist in the 1960s, but he's a pioneering guitarist all the way up until the 1980s. Uh, this makes him ca comparable for me to a guitarist like Jeff Beck. In other words, he kept going. Now, uh, in the mid 80s, he brought out another album called Guitar, which is another wonderful album, a double album full of guitar solos. So with these two albums, we have you know five discs worth of guitar solos. But also there's been all sorts of other albums come out which feature Frank's guitar playing centre stage. It's an album full of guitar solos. Now, many guitarists could not pull this off, but Zappa did. And I think it's down to his incredible um, compositional ability as a guitar soloist, but also the pioneering use of effects, of guitar tones, and also um, the um, innovations that he developed in terms of how the rhythm section relates to um, the, the, the solo. Often when he soloed, he would um, utilize a reggae rhythm. And the, it was a very specific reggae rhythm where the, um, the, the drop was on beat three. That type of re reggae rhythm. So that's a rhythm where we have no beat one, and also we have a lot of space. And off often when you listen to Zappa's um, backgrounds that you're soloing over, 
they have been designed to promote improvisation you know so with a lot of rock guitarists you often find that the guitar solo is part of a song and they are soloing over the structure of that song sometimes they might write a middle part for them to solo over it uh, but on the whole that that middle part will relate to the song in some way Zappa is exploring improvisational specific backgrounds that will promote a depth of improvisation that will drive his guitar playing uh, to create new compositional ideas. So when we stand back and look at Frank Zappa we can see that um, he's an incredible guitarist. His um, virtuosity is his own virtuosity. When you improvise you are playing your own set of rules, right? He was not a virtuoso in the same sense as a Steve Vai. And this is why he hired Steve Vai to play the incredibly difficult parts um, on guitar that he could not play. Now, this for me does not mean he's an inferior guitarist to Steve Vai. Um, what it means is, is that um, it's a different type of virtuosity. Now, when we look at a guitarist like Jimi Hendrix, it's taken for granted that he is exploring a different type of virtuosity to someone like Steve Vai. That we 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 um, we we understand that his use of feedback and distortion and noise and all these types of things that um, Hendrix did, and also his incredible feeling for the blues is where the virtuosity is. Now I have met many guitarists that when they listen to Hendrix, cannot really understand his greatness because they've grown up listening to all those eighties rock guitarists like Ingvy Malmsteen and Paul Gilbert, and they're comparing him to that. That way of playing guitar, I think, has has become a dead end. I uh, was uh, on YouTube, some guy had put up a video of sort of new up and coming guitarists, all these Instagram guitarists. And they were all coming out doing all these sort of real, you know, jumping through technical hoops, you know, virtuosity, brilliance, you know. And, and as these guitarists were cut together and they were moving, if I'd have closed my eyes, I could not have told where one guitarist stopped and another guitarist started. They had exactly the same tone. They had exactly the same technique. They played exactly the same licks. The things that we are supposed to go ooh at, they were all doing. It was basically a lot of trained monkeys who have sat there watching YouTube trying to pull off what other people have done. This is guitar playing going up its own bottom as far as I'm concerned and I do not class this as virtuoso guitar playing. For me fundamental the virtuosity comes from the vision. It's the ability to, uh, to develop techniques that create new forms of expression. When somebody um, develops a new way of playing that then the sheep will follow. So for example, Frank Zappa was an absolute virtuoso in his control of feedback. Uh, Carlos Santana is another virtuoso that could control feedback in incredible ways, as um, is Gary Moore. Right? Zappa's control of feedback is absolutely virtuoso. If you put most guitarists on a stage in a big, in a big concert hall like Zappa would be in with that huge amp and turned up Zappa's guitar the way it would set up they would not be able con to control that sound. Zappa was able to control his sound absolutely incredibly and ride on the back of that feedback. That is a virtuosity. That is a technical ability that other people would not be able to do. The problem we've got gu with guitar playing is the guitar playing has become a set of rules and somebody has to come out and they have to do some nice bending, play some melodic stuff, then they're going to play some very fast alternate picking, three note per string, and then some very fast um, legato, three note per string, then they may sweep and then they all tap. And these things, and this really goes back to Eddie Van Halen, but the difference with Eddie Van Halen is those techniques that he pioneered, he pioneered to express himself. And that is why Eddie Van Halen sounds unlike any other guitarist. All those guitarists who tried to copy him do not sound like him. And this is the same is true of Frank Zappa, who was a true original, a great guitar player. And really, when we start to say the great guitarists, Jimi Hendrix, Jeff Beck, 
Jimmy Page, Richie Blackmore, Eddie Van Halen, right? When we run through that sort of legendary pantheon of, you know, um, of, of, of legends, I've used the word legend twice there, I think Frank Zappa needs to be put on that list and we need to realise that he is up there and in some cases beyond these guitarists. And I think we need to reevaluate Frank Zappa as a guitar player. And if you're a guitar player that is struggling trying to understand what he's doing and it just sounds like it's messy, it might be the time to actually start exploring these uh, use of tuplets and sound and the different picking techniques that he uses and, and judge him in his own merits, in his own world, to, to the, the, the specific techniques that he pioneered on guitar. Anyway, that's the end of this video. If you like this video, put a like on it. If you want to um, see more stuff like this, subscribe. You could sort support me over on Patreon if you want. Uh, the link is down below. And if not, I've got a, a PayPal tip jar. The link's there as well. And, and uh, some lovely people will give me little donations. I'm really, and some of them are so little as well. And it's really great. And I'm hoping this year to um, really be able to kick this YouTube channel, you know, up. You know, I'm getting a new computer soon, which uh, will mean I'll be able to do better editing and, and I'm trying to get um, the quality, especially on my interviews, the the, uh, the quality of those a bit higher. So um, hopefully that's all going to happen. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video.